Okay, um, hello, welcome to Mayor Brown's Silicon Docs, Silicon Valley, International Arbitration in Ireland and the US webinar. Uh, apologies for the delay getting started. Uh, as you all saw, we ran into a few technical issues. My name is James Coleman. I'm originally from Galway, Ireland, but I practice law in the US, uh, where I'm an associate in Mayor Brown's International Arbitration practice. I'm joined today by a number of excellent co-presenters from both the US and Ireland, who we will introduce shortly. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to begin. If, I'd like to mention a few housekeeping announcements. Please note, when accessing Mayor Brown's webinars via our WebEx platform, we suggest avoiding software such as Citrix to decrease disruption or quality loss. Secondly, today's program is being streamed through your computer, so there's no dial-in number. Uh, for the best audio quality, please make sure your computer speakers or headset volume is turned up so you can hear the presentation. If you have any questions during the presentation, I invite you to let us know via the Q&A feature. Uh, that's on the right side of your screen where you can simply type your question into the chat box. We'll do our best to address questions live or after today's program. We're getting CLE credit for US attorneys. We'll provide an alphanumeric code during this presentation. In order to receive CLE credit, participants must record this code on a virtual sign-in sheet that was emailed to you with the login instructions for today's program. Please return this form within 10 days of the event by either scanning or taking photos of the form and emailing copies to cle-events at mayorbrown.com or by faxing the form to plus one three one two seven zero one seven seven one one. With those housekeeping matters addressed, I'd like to introduce Jim Wexel, who will introduce our panelists. Uh, Jim is an attorney with Dimler, Armstrong and Rowland's San Francisco office and he serves as president of the Irish American Bar Association of Northern California. Thank you, James. And I'm thrilled to welcome you all to our program today. It's my great privilege to introduce this group of panelists. We're especially honored to welcome John Bruton, a former Taoiseach of Ireland and former ambassador of the European Union to the United States. He is currently chairman of the Ireland for Law Implementation Group, which was established by the government of Ireland to promote Irish law and Irish legal services to the international business community, particularly in areas where Ireland is a world leader, including aviation finance, funds, insurance, tech, pharma, and life sciences. Mr. Justice David Barneville also joins us today. Justice Barneville was appointed to the High Court of Ireland in 2017. He is currently the judge in charge of the di commercial vi division of that court. He is also designated as the arbitration judge to hear all arbitration related matters in the high court. Michael Collins is a senior counsel in Ireland who is also a member of a number of other bars, including England, Northern Ireland, and New York. Patrick Mayer is a barrister in Dublin and specializes in commercial litigation and arbitration. Prior to commencing practice in Ireland, Patrick worked in New York in the areas of commercial litigation and arbitration. Sarah Reynolds is a partner in Mayor Brown's Chicago and Palo Alto offices and an integral member of Mayor Brown's international arbitration practice. Sarah is also the newest member of our Bar Association's Board of Directors, and we're very grateful for her dedication and effort in putting to helping put to today's program together. And I would also like to extend an invitation for all of you to enroll in the Irish American Bar Association of Northern California. We're expanding our roster of programs and activities and would love to see you again in the future. For more information, please go to our website at irishamericanbarnorcal.com. Thank you everyone. And I'll turn the program back over to James. Thank you, Jim. Uh, we decided to host today's webinar because we are seeing an increasing level of interest from our clients in negotiating dispute resolution clauses that identify Ireland as a seat for any potential international arbitration. Uh, regarding this, I, I'd like to direct the first question to Mr. Bruton. Uh, Mr. Bruton, you're now chairman of the Ireland for Law Implementation Group. Uh, first, can you explain the role of this organization and can you, can you explain why, in your view, tech companies and other multinational corporations should consider Ireland and the Irish legal system for their arbitrations? Well, Ireland has a very strong legal tradition. Uh, from the end of this year, Ireland will be the only common law country in the European Union, the only English speaking country in the European Union. But Ireland is also the home of many US owned uh, businesses in the field of funds, in the field of pharmaceuticals, and in the field of aviation. And obviously, these firms need to uh, 
find a suitable location in which to write their contracts, have their contracts litigated, or engage in arbitration. And the purpose of uh, Ireland for Law is to introduce international operators, international firms, and their legal counsel to the services that the Irish legal system can provide. We have a modern, well-updated legal system, which by virtue of its being a common law system will be familiar to many people involved in legal issues in the United States, Canada, and the English speaking world. And that's why we feel it's very timely now that we are to be the only English speaking common law country in the European Union to introduce legal services to a wider audience. And that's what Ireland for Law does. And re regarding the point you just raised about the European Union, uh, Mr. Bruton, uh, given your former role as an ambassador of the European Union to the United States, and I'm sure the uh, tough work negotiating with the UK in the lead up to the Good Friday Agreement, uh, it'd be interesting to hear your take on how Brexit is going to affect Ireland's role as a global legal centre. Well, Ireland was already, uh, because it was in the European Union, it has been in the European Union for quite some time, very attractive to North American firms who wanted to establish a bridge into Europe. Uh, but they had until now the alternative of doing that through the United Kingdom or through Ireland. But now that the United Kingdom has decided to leave the European Union and disentangle itself from the European Union, the opportunity offered by Ireland is more intense than it was before. Uh, and we expect to see, and indeed we already have seen, quite a number of financial services firms relocating from London to Dublin because they want to be headquartered in or operating from a European Union country, and Ireland meets that requirement. Sure. Um, I, I'd like to address a question to my colleague, Sarah Reynolds. Um, I, I, I know in, in our Chicago office, we've seen an increase in the number of US clients interested in considering Ireland as an option. Uh, Sarah works in our Palo Alto office. And I, I'm wondering, Sarah, can you, um, can you talk to whether there has been a large increase there and uh, why, why there is such an increase in interest? Sure, James. I'm happy to. Um, yeah, it's a it's a recent trend, but but a trend nonetheless. In the last two to three years, um, and this is based on my own uh, study of the arbitration clauses that I've I've reviewed. So uh, you can debate the scientific certainty of these assertions, but um, I've certainly drafted and reviewed more and more clauses that select Ireland as the seat, and that's particularly too true in the technology sector. Some of the ones that um, that uh, Mr. Bruton already mentioned, you know, with um, aerospace and pharmaceuticals, but more and more are, you know, our sort of Silicon Valley type technology companies are looking at Ireland as well. Um, that, and that's a result of a curve convergence of a number of factors, some that have already been mentioned, but, you know, language, cost, Brexit implications, um, similarities between the legal system, the fact that there's a specialized judiciary with Judge Barneville, um, in Dublin, and you know, there's a roster of experienced arbitrators available. Um, and then there's just the presence of many U.S. technology companies in Dublin through various forms of corporate formation. So Dublin is familiar ground for many of these companies, and so there's a general um, rising comfort level as uh, with Dublin as a seat for arbitration, and we're seeing more and more clients interested in exploring that option. Uh, so, so you mentioned uh, one factor being the role of the designated arbitration judge. Um, since we're lucky enough to have the designated arbitration judge here with us today, uh, Mr. Justice Barnival, um, can you tell us uh, what that role is uh, and, and, uh, and uh, like what, what that would mean for parties in litigation in Ireland and parties in arbitration in Ireland? James, thank you very much. And can I first say what a great pleasure it is to be asked to uh, speak at this this event. Um, uh, Irish judges are, are always very happy to speak at events like this. Uh, and anything that promotes Ireland and Ireland's legal system is something that the judiciary here uh, have um, all always supported and are delighted to do so. Um, a designated judge uh, under the Arbitration Act is um, a High Court judge uh, taken from the roster of High Court judges who 
uh, will deal with all arbitration related cases and applications in the High Court. And that judge is designated in that capacity by the president of the High Court. So the judge who's in charge of the High Court will pick a judge. And it, at the moment, that judge is myself. And um, when I uh, was a, a, appointed uh, in 2017, when I was appointed to the bench, I had for the previous number of years done uh, um, an increasing amount of arbitration work. So I had a fair degree of, uh, I had some experience and a lot of interest in, in, in arbitration. So when the um, opportunity came to serve as the designated arbitration judge, I, I was delighted to do so. My predecessor, who was uh, Judge McGovern, was also a very experienced arbitration uh, practitioner and then in that capacity arbitration judge and his predecessor, Mr. Justice Kelly. So I was following in uh, big footsteps there. But I, th I think the, the point being that that people who are appointed to that position are those people who have had some experience in practice uh, in arbitration work. And I think that very much, uh, very much helps. It's obviously not the only position I, I hold. I also am the judge in charge of the commercial court here. So the two dovetail actually quite, uh, quite nicely. But it does mean when you've got one judge dealing with all of the applications, it does mean that you have the advantage of consistency and certainty in decision making. And it means that um, people can go to the court here and, and pretty much know what the trend in the decisions uh, is and how, and they're pretty much able to predict, I think, in most cases, how a case is likely to go based on the previous decisions. Uh, thank you, Judge. And um, one issue regarding certainty and uh, just the similarity between jurisdictions uh, that may be quite relevant is that Ireland's Arbitration Act 2010 is modelled on the UNSA trial model law. Um, can you opine as to what features of the Arbitration Act 2010 in particular make Ireland a suitable seat for arbitration? Uh, and what, what features um, should our clients consider when they're deciding whether to uh, pick Ireland as a seat for arbitration? So, so I think a couple of points can be, or a few points can be made about the R2010 Act. I think the first is that um, a group of leading arbitration practitioners including one of the panelists, Michael Collins, and several of the attendees, um, were very much involved in the drafting of that legislation um, in the period leading up to its enactment in 2010. And they worked very closely with the then Attorney General, who's coincidentally now the current Attorney General, again, um, in, in pushing for that legislation to be passed. And it's legislation that would be familiar with many other jurisdictions around the world. The, the UNCTAD trial model law is obviously something that many people are aware of. And what we did in our 2010 Act was we gave force of law in, our, in Irish law to the UNCTAD trial model law, but we put some improvements in there as well. And unusually, we have applied that model law both not just to international arbitrations, which is really where people would perhaps um, be more familiar with it, but also to our domestic arbitration. So a lot of um, a lot of expert legal practitioner input went into it, and it, it and it led to the enactment of that act. So there are a few things about it I think that are important. Firstly, the act itself and the way it's been interpreted by our courts ha have demonstrated an enormous amount of support for the arbitral uh, process and. A, a, a reluctance to interfere with or to cut across what the parties agreed um, should be their dispute resolution procedure. Um, uh, the next point I think is uh, perhaps unusually, both our courts and the arbitration tribunal have the power to intervene to make uh, interim orders um, in aid of the, of the arbitration. And that can be a very important uh, feature. But the next point is we uh, have very limited grounds under our legislation to set aside an arbitration award. Um, it, it, it takes quite a lot to have an award set aside, and, and our courts have interpreted those um, uh, conditions, the conditions for setting aside an, an award, quite restrictively. The next point, I think, is the recognition and enforcement of uh, awards. We, we've also adopted in that legislation the New York uh, Convention on the Recognition of Foreign uh, Arbitration Awards. But there are very limited grounds in which recognition will be refused under our act and by, by our courts. Um, and, and we've interpreted, say, the public policy exception pretty restrictively, very much along the lines of the US courts. And in fact, our leading decision on public policy, re a refusal to recognize an award, is a decision of one of the uh, circuit appeal courts in, in New York. Um, we also, our courts have shown themselves very 
willing to stay proceedings and to refer parties to arbitration where there's an arbitration agreement. And that's all applying very much the provisions of our Act and the model law. And maybe then the next point to make is um, we have what's called a one-stop shop. That means your arbitration application will be dealt with by the designated High Court judge. There is, in most cases, no appeal from that decision to the Court of Appeal or to the Supreme Court. So it means you get you get a shot uh, before the High Court, uh, and that's pretty much the end of the road. And I think that can be usefully contrasted with the legislation in some other jurisdictions, where while your arbitration may take place very quickly, um, parties then, if they wish to challenge the award or to go to court for some reason, they find themselves embroiled in a lengthy appellate process. We don't have that problem in this jurisdiction. Um, so they are, I think, the, the essential points I would like to make about our Arbitration Act 2010 and, and why I think it's um, an, a, a useful piece of legislation and one that should be attractive to those who wish to carry on business in this jurisdiction um, in circumstances where they know if they have an arbitration agreement, it's one which the courts are likely, save in very exceptional circumstances, to uphold and enforce. Uh, thank you, Judge. Uh, you mentioned at one point there uh, interim protective measures. Uh, we're, we're, we're noticing uh, quite an increasing trend in jurisdictions across the world for more interim uh, more of a move towards having allowing interim protective measures and interim remedies. Um, I, I'm wondering if you could just point further about what form uh, interim protective measures in Ireland would take. Well, well first of all, the, the, the procedure, um, it, the, the form they take is just like um, an application in any piece of civil litigation to stop some uh, stop documents being destroyed, to stop uh, the, the, to preserve the status quo, to prevent some act taking place that would undermine significantly the arbitration. And the, our act actually says that the court will the court will deal with an application like that in precisely the same way as it will deal with an application for an, an injunction in civil proceedings. And the procedure is very straightforward. You, you simply apply by a, a document called a notice of motion, and you will then be sent to the designated arbitration judge. And, and that can be activated very short notice because, uh, as people will, will 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 know, sometimes it's it's necessary to act very quickly and sometimes without notice to the opposing side. And our system allows that to be done. Uh, ultimately, obviously, the uh, the opposing side will be heard. But in the case of extreme urgency, there is a facility to apply uh, very quickly and, and without notice. Uh, thank you, Judge. Um, just despite the Arbitration Act uh, only coming into force in two thousand and ten. Uh, there appears to be a large body of case law and jurisprudence already developed regarding it. Uh, I'm just wondering if you can comment on, on significant arbitration related and commercial jurisprudence uh, that international ar parties arbitrating in Ireland should be aware of. Uh, uh, James, just a couple of points on that. Um, firstly, the, the arbitration case law. The case law so far has tended to focus or to be generated by domestic, from domestic arbitrations. Mostly in the case of international arbitrations here, that it, it, it hasn't actually had to end up in court proceedings. And so most of our case law is case law that gener that's generated from domestic arbitrations. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, the, the 2010 Act applies equally to domestic arbitrations. So the principles that we've derived in our cases apply equally to cases that come from international arbitration disputes. Um, I think you've put in the pack a couple of judgments uh, on the arbitration side. Um, one of them being a, a relatively recent judgment called Naruma that has a, a, arose out of the, the start of the pandemic, and that involved a dispute between a, a contractor and the state concerning the implementation of hundreds of ventilators necessary to uh, treat people uh, for severe um, for severe COVID-related uh, illnesses. That led to proceedings which led to an application to stay the proceedings because of an arbitration clause uh, and the court, uh, and it, it actually just myself, um, decided to refer that to, to arbitration. That case and the next case in the pack called XPL, I think are good examples of where the courts have explicitly expressed their support for arbitration. There's a, a, a list of commercial uh, case law as well that's given there, and they uh, um, show how our commercial courts here has got an increasingly international uh, aspect to its work. 
And we've listed a few different cases for, to show the different types of cases coming before our commercial court, um, many of which have a, an American dimension to it. A, and one of the things to, 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 to note is, obviously, uh, Mr. Bruton mentioned earlier, the, the increasing numbers of tech companies and so on in this jurisdiction, financial services companies. We also have a large number of pharma companies and some of the judgments that are listed there, I, I think um, the, the Merck case and the Gilead case, that they they are judged they are judgments delivered by one of our judges sitting on the commercial court who has an ex extensive patent experience. We've got two judges now in our commercial uh, court roster who were um, IP practitioners at the bar and who are now dealing with some of these very complex patent cases. A, a large number of which arise because of the the uh, pharma companies based in Ireland. We've also developed jurisdiction here, international jurisdiction on what are called corporate schemes of arrangement, many of which have a US connection. The first case mentioned in the list is a case of Nordic aviation, and that arose out of the insolvency of one of the largest um, uh, regional aircraft leasing companies in the world. Uh, a, a, a number of American entities involved, New York law involved, and um, that led to a fairly lengthy judgment, which is, uh, I think, hyperlinked in the papers. And the other two cases mentioned there, case of Trafalgar, uh, is, is a case involving a Russian um, ammonia business, a row between various parties, mainly Russian parties, to do with um, uh, the ownership of an uh, industrial ammonia business. Now, I, I shouldn't say too much about that because aspects of that case, the big jurisdiction of the Irish courts are under challenge and judgment is reserved in that issue. And the last case shows a, a case where about 15 different jurisdictions have been involved, um, ranging from the Caribbean to the Far East to the Middle East and so on. And the, the point being, I think, that our courts are seeing an increasing international dimension to the cases that we're, we're dealing with. And I think the final point perhaps I'd make is the Irish courts will be quite familiar, I think, the way we run things to American lawyers. Um, the only real difference is being we, we don't have juries hearing most of our cases and we don't have depositions, but a US lawyer walking into an Irish court will actually find it quite familiar. And I, that, as, uh, that is perhaps also due to the fact that Irish lawyers um, have long standing close relationships with US attorneys and US trial, judge, uh, trial, trial lawyers, including Michael Collins, who's going to be mm -hmm. speaking later on. And um, we have well established links with uh, US judges and, and uh, US uh, uh, trial lawyers. Uh, thank you, Judge. And, and you, you just mentioned uh, Michael Collins, who I'd, I'd like to uh, bring into the discussion. Um, and Michael has, in his past, also practiced law in the US before practicing in Ireland and the, um, England, uh, in Wales and Northern Ireland. Um, but Michael, I, I'd like to ask, how many US tech companies have located their European headquarters in Ireland, uh, such as Facebook, Google, Twitter, etc.? Um, I'm wondering what implications does that have for the Irish legal and regulatory system? Well, James, uh, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to be here. It's, uh, a very large number of those companies have, in fact, located their European headquarters in Ireland, primarily in Dublin, and includes the companies you've mentioned, like Google and Facebook and so forth. And that does give rise to quite a number of significant both legal and regulatory aspects, principally because under the um, GDPR, the General Data Protection Directive, the regulator, in our case, the Data Protection Commissioner for privacy and data issues, uh, is the lead regulator in the jurisdiction where these companies are headquartered. So the Irish Data Protection Commissioner, currently Helen Dixon, is in fact the lead regulator for companies such as Google and Facebook in Europe. And that was why, for example, um, to follow on from Judge Barnabas' description of some of the international type of litigation we get, um, following the Snowden disclosures, you may recall Max Schrems, an Austrian activist in privacy issues, he commenced proceedings or a complaint to the Data Protection Commissioner that the transfers of personal data by Yahoo, sorry, by Facebook to the United States breached the protections available to European citizens under the relevant charter and uh, treaty provisions, in particular because in the US, EU citizens lacked the sort of standing necessary to challenge some of the activities of US surveillance uh, institutions. And ultimately, the commissioner took on that complaint. Uh, there's a complicated 
procedure, uh, procedural history to it, but it ended up being referred by the Irish court after a six week hearing on US law in relation to these issues. It was referred to the European Court of Justice, which struck down the arrangements under which those data transfers take place from Europe to the US under what's called the Privacy Shield arrangements. And uh, as a consequence, it would appear that the, tr the transfers that certainly some of the companies, such as Facebook, were making were no longer lawful. Uh, they've attempted to make the transfers under alternative arrangements, but the Data Protection Commission has now sought to suspend those data transfers, uh, which Facebook themselves have now challenged in legal proceedings pending before the Irish court and likely to be heard, I think, by Mr. Justice Barneville. So I better not say any more about it than that. Um, but that does give you an example of the intersection between the location of these companies in Ireland and the resulting tsunami of both legal and regulatory issues that flow from that, all of which fall to be dealt with by the Irish courts and Irish lawyers. Uh, thanks, Michael. And so, so sh shifting gears somewhat um, uh, back, back to, uh, specifically back to, back to arbit some arbitration issues. I'm wondering, you know, you've sat on many occasions as an arbitrator in Ireland, uh, and indeed some of the very limited case law in the United States on enforcement of Irish arbitration awards uh, are enforcing awards you yourself issued. Uh, I'm wondering if you could tell us about selecting arbitrators in Ireland uh, and whether there's a robust roster of experienced arbitrators from which to choose. The short answer is yes, there are. Um, I suppose in a sense it dates back to what Judge Barneville was talking about when the Act was introduced in 2010, which in turn was prompted, I think, by the holding of the annual ICA conference in 2008 here. And I think a lot of people recognized that Ireland could be a very fruitful and useful venue for arbitrations to take place, allied to the fact that there was a very significant number of lawyers who were, I, I hope I can say, very skilled and very experienced and deal with very complex litigation. Uh, apart from the fact that many of them have a lot of experience in other jurisdictions, be it working with the European Commission, working with magic circle firms in London or large law firms in the US. One of our speakers, Patrick Mayer, for example, spent many years uh, work, working in the US. And that's a, an increasingly common feature that you find among Irish lawyers. And can I just give you at the risk of invoking statistics, can I give you two statistics that I think just demonstrate the extent to which Irish arbitrators and lawyers are punching way above their weight in this field. The, both the ICC, the uh, International Chamber of Commerce in Paris, and the LCIA, the London Court of International Arbitration, publish annual reports. And the most recent one for the ICC for 2019 shows that there were 107 arbitrators appointed that year from the United States, but there were 15 from Ireland. Now, if you consider the respective size of the professions in the United States and Ireland, 15 compared to 107 shows you how disproportionately uh, weighted it is towards Ireland. The LCIA report is even more impressive. Ireland coincidentally had also 15 arbitrators appointed that year. I don't know if there were the same 15 or not, uh, probably not. Uh, but the United States had 33, uh, which again is a remarkable comparison, and Switzerland had 11. So we actually had more arbitrators than Switzerland had appointed. So the, the hard evidence is that there's a very substantial roster of very experienced and qualified practitioners who uh, have great experience in the field of arbitration and who act as arbitrators frequently appointed by these uh, institutions that administer international arbitrations. Uh, so building on that somewhat, um, we heard Justice Barneville talk about the Arbitration Act 2010. And, uh, I'm wondering, are there specific issues we should be aware of uh, under the Arbitration Act itself regarding deployment and challenge uh, challenges to uh, uh, arbitrators? Well, the, the arbitrator's challenge provisions are really governed by the model law, which are, of course, an integral part of the 2010 Act. So if you want to make a challenge, you make it in the first instance to the tribunal itself. And if you're not satisfied with the outcome of that, you can go to the court, which in, in this instance is the Irish court, um, for the purpose of resolving the challenge to the, the uh, um, independence or whatever the uh, ground of challenge is. Um, but I think what's significant from a US perspective is that if you choose arbitrators from a number of different jurisdictions, you can run into cultural and ethical conflicts where 
either the arbitrators themselves or indeed the lawyers from different jurisdictions appearing before the arbitrators have very different standards of how they should behave or what is the appropriate way to approach a case. And let me give you one example, uh, disclosure of documents. Um, in, in Ireland, for example, and in the common law jurisdictions, uh, there's an obligation on the lawyers to ensure that full and proper disclosure is made, even if it's against the interests of the client. In a number of South American countries, you're actually obliged to hold back the documents if it's going to harm your client's case, and it could be professional negligence to actually disclose the documents. So if you have two people who are lawyers on the opposite side of a case, it's not necessarily a level playing pitch because the lawyers who see themselves as subject to the ethical duty to disclose the documents are pitched against perhaps a lawyer from a different jurisdiction who doesn't see herself as having that obligation at all. And how do the arbitrators resolve that? And how do they do it if they're from a different uh, constitutional or cultural background? Irish lawyers are, as Judge Barnabas has pointed out, very much um, familiar with the US legal system, the US ethical values. Uh, we have a constitutional structure very similar to the US. Irish constitutional law cases frequently cite US constitutional law cases as precedents. And of course, the common law system is common to both countries. And as Judge Barnabas said, if you walk into an Irish court, an American lawyer would feel very much at home. So by choosing Irish lawyers and Irish arbitrators and locating the arbitration in Ireland, you're very much on home territory. US lawyers will find themselves comfortable with that, and they won't run into this conflict of ethical and cultural values, which can sometimes make international arbitration very difficult. Right, and, and you mentioned there um, about document production as well and differences between jurisdictions. Uh, given our practice in the US, we seem to uh, d uh, disclose that everything but the kitchen sink in documents or in discovery. Um, I'd be quite interested in getting uh, your take and Patrick Mayer's take, given that you both practice in the US and in Ireland, uh, on what discovery is allowed in arbitration season in Ireland, uh, what's the permissible scope of discovery and how this compares uh, to the US. Well, of course, one of the big differences is that we, both in the court system and indeed in the arbitration system here, we don't have the concept of depositions as you have in, in the US. And the concept of discovery in the US as being in effect, ostensibly the examination of documents and clarification through depositions is something we don't have. We have merely disclosure of the relevant documents, but disclosure or discovery as we call it, has bedeviled our system for years because it used to be the case that anything that was relevant in the sense of likely to put you or the other side on a train of inquiry that was useful had to be disclosed. We've changed our court rules of disclosure in recent years to make it much more tailored and much more focused on what is necessary and relevant and probative in a sense to resolving the actual issues rather than having to simply disclose anything and everything. International arbitration, of course, tends to concentrate that even more because many of the rules such as the IBA rules on disclosure in international arbitration are driven by a lot of civil lawyer input and civil lawyers, of course, in say continental Europe are pretty appalled at the type of disclosure that is ordered even in countries like Ireland and England, never mind in the United States. And they see it very much as a much more restricted exercise. Um, so we're trying to balance that in Ireland, uh, but certainly the Irish arbitrators are conscious of that much more restrictive uh, disclosure regime that operates in international arbitration and the much higher burden that rests on the parties to justify a disclosure request. And indeed, in our court system, we're attempting to learn from international arbitration and some feedback perhaps from the way it's done in international arbitration to try to um, control the monster that, that is uh, disclosure and discovery. Great. And uh, uh, following up on that, I'm wondering, Patrick, do you have any further comments to add regarding the, the differences in discovery between the two, two jurisdictions? Well, I mean, as a general matter, the differences in the approach to discovery um, are, are well known in that the, you know, the US does have a very liberal permissive attitude. Uh, the Irish approach um, somewhat less um, uh, liberal. And I would say, you know, uh, Michael mentioned that there have been problems over the past, past number of years trying to kind of leash the, put a leash on the on the monster of discovery, and and that that's how 
that's had some effect. And it also a, a, a large scale review of the um, civil justice system underway, which will likely um, result in some recommendations regarding changes to the rules, which would also have a, have an effect, uh, a restrictive effect on, on permissible discovery. Um, I mean, in my experience in both jurisdictions, uh, the Irish expectations or expectations of practitioners in Ireland with respect to discovery can be, um, you know, quite similar to the to what's expected by American practitioners. But in general, you know, when it boils down to it, you're probably going to be entitled to less than what you would get in the US. And you often see it, say, in intellectual property cases where there's the multi jurisdictional aspect. Um, what ends up being uh, discovered or produced in Ireland is is a you know significant subset of what has been produced in in very similar cases in involving the same patents, for example, in uh, U.S. proceedings. I mean, so far as arbitration goes, um, as Judge Barneville and, and Michael pointed out, it's you know the, the 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 Bible is is the model law. I mean, that's that's the controlling statute. So. Um, that doesn't make express provision for discovery and arbitrations. It, it's really a function of the party's agreement, and in default of that, it, it comes down to uh, what the what the tribunal decides. Um, there's, uh, you know, there's there's a I suppose common practice of the adoption of the IBA rules, and that has a dampening effect on the scope of the discovery um, that will ultimately be allowed. Um, you know, we kind of hitch our wagon to this um, uh, civil law law culture of, of of less rather than more discovery, um, and so I think there it's not so much that there is a there is permissible discovery in arbitrations, but I think in practice it it tends to um, trend towards uh, less is more, um, and it doesn't mirror what um, would be expected in conventional um, civil litigation. Right, and to take advantage again uh, 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 of your background as both uh, an attorney in the US and as a barrister in Ireland, uh, I'm wondering if, if you could provide some comments on the um, in, uh, enforcement issues in Ireland uh, and, and, ha and what you think about how they'd be enforced, Irish awards would be enforced in the US. And I, I'd also be grateful if uh, Sarah Reynolds could jump in on this as well, seeing, seeing as she practices international arbitration in the US at the moment. Well, I mean, it, I guess it goes back to what, what Judge Barnabas said at the outset, which is that there is very strong support for the arbitral process in Ireland. It's a, it's a, it, the, the policy is pro-arbitration, and that's been clear for quite a long time. But I mean, in particular, since the Arbitration Act 2010, which, which, um, which you know, completely regenerated the regime regarding arbitration. Um, the the act uh, embodies the New York Convention and also, um, as I said, the model law. And so that you know, enforcement, recognition, and enforcement of awards made outside of Ireland is clearly provided for um, in the model law. It's Article thirty five uh, and thirty six. And you know, in thirty six, you have the grounds for refusal uh, to enforce an award. They're very restrictive. Um, the restrictiveness has been has been kind of respected by uh, the courts. They're exhaustive, so you can't just, you know, gin up some reason for why an award would be rather shouldn't be enforced. That's not set out in the in the rules. Um, Judge Barnival, I think, mentioned the public policy element, which sometimes is the unknown quantity in these things. Um, you know, it's sort of the last refuge of the of the disappointed um, party. They try to shoehorn some um uh, fanciful reason into the public policy uh exemption again judge wonderful mentioned judge Barnival mentioned there was there, there there is case law which uh indicates a very restrictive approach to what 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 that public policy ground uh, entails um and it's it's uh as the judge said modeled on or taken from a, a, a second circuit decision so there really aren't um, there really aren't you know elaborate grounds in which a court could refuse to enforce an award. It's 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 there in black and white, and uh, courts won't courts won't um, depart from it easily, uh, or or they won't depart from what's what's down in black and white at all. But they won't, I suppose, give the benefit of the doubt. I would say to uh, parties coming in, 
um, trying to oppose enforcement. I mean, there is there is an issue around jurisdiction, which is slightly different. Um, you know, the court has to have have jurisdiction to uh, to entertain the application. Um, so there has been some there is a line of authority to the fact that you know where there is no connection whatsoever with the jurisdiction. Uh, the court won't enforce an award, and that that's really uh, I suppose consistent throughout um, sophisticated jurisdictions that they they won't allow forum shopping. Um, but besides that, uh, it's quite a predictable, uh, concrete regime regarding the enforcement of arbitration awards. Right, uh, and to build further on that, I, I'm wondering, Sarah, if if you could opine as to uh, uh, enforcement of Irish arbitration awards in the US, is there anything particular that we should consider. Thanks, Jamie. Yeah, I, you know, the US treats these awards very similar to Ireland. The New York Convention gives us prescribed bases for challenging an award. Courts have been instructed repeatedly to interpret those bases in, you know, the most restrictive way possible. Just about every time that the Supreme Court has had the opportunity to opine on arbitration issues, they've taken a very pro arbitration stance and have repeatedly. Uh, made the point that the United States is to be a jurisdiction that is supportive of of international arbitration. So um, the the process of enforcing a, an Irish award in in the U.S. so long as the jurisdictional question is cleared is relatively straightforward and a fairly simple procedure. I think that the overall theme here is really sameness between the two jurisdictions. Um, the U.S. and Irish courts take very similar positions on arbitration issues. And the U.S. may have a more um, robust history of dealing with arbitration awards, just in terms of volume, as compared to Ireland, um, and so has a broader um, universe of precedent on which to, to lie, rely. But with Justice Barnville serving in the role that he's in, Ireland is essentially assuring users um, of an informed, experienced, and specialized domestic court decision maker in Ireland, and that should go a long way in assuaging parties' concerns. Um, about using Ireland as a seat or about um, having awards, Irish awards are forced, enforced in the United States. Sure, and, and jumping somewhat to more practical concerns, I, I, I welcome thoughts from Patrick and, and Michael and Judge Barnival as well regarding uh, the facilities that are available to arbitrators or for arbitrations in Ireland and the, the relative costs of an arbitration in Ireland compared to other jurisdictions. Uh, well, I suppose I can start. Uh, there, there is a, a, a specific purpose-built uh, arbitration centre uh, in Dublin, which is, uh, you know, very well equipped with plenty of technology and plenty of breakout rooms and conference rooms of different sizes. Um, so that's really the the hub, I would say, in Dublin at least, of of um, the arbitration world and. Uh, the facilities, I, I would say, are, are you know equal to to anything available in the traditional arbitration centres in London, New York. Um, so the facilities are are you know more than adequate from that from that perspective. Likewise, I would think the availability of technology. Um, I know we've kind of all been dealing with um, in more recent times um, electronic trials and and you know there's more of a need to. Uh, make use of you know, electronic trial techniques. Uh, there are several outfits in Dublin who are pretty busy at the moment providing um, technology like that. So that's all available too. And then obviously the various other functions that come with a hearing um, are you know very well established in in in, in Dublin, like um, court reporters and uh, stenographers, things like that. So I think. Uh, you know, it's it's very safe to say that the facilities available in Dublin for uh, an arbitration of of any size, I would say, um, are are more than adequate. Yeah, could I just perhaps add to that? Yeah, arbitrators are not just focused on what the legal issues are in terms of the law and the choice of um, uh, venue. They're actually concerned with what are the support facilities available in a jurisdiction ranging from things like broadband to very good restaurants so they can go and eat in in the evening and so forth, uh, or a good choice of hotels. And Ireland and Dublin, it's a relatively small city, but it has a very large number of extremely good hotels and restaurants. It has a very, there's a huge investment in broadband that has been made, so there are very good broadband facilities. Um, 
Irish people tend to speak very fast. And as a result, we possibly have the best stenographers in the world who can keep it. <laughs> Um, we think we have some of the best lawyers, and we certainly have the best bars. So all of those are <laughs> reasons to arbitrate in Dublin. So unfortunately, this year we, uh, with COVID, we're not able to travel to Ireland. Uh, that, that raises yet another consideration. Uh, I wonder, Michael, if you could uh, uh, talk to us about um, the comfort level of uh, arbitrators in Ireland with uh, using remote proceedings. Uh, for those of us who practice in the US, being able to I guess dial in and uh, work in these matters remotely uh, is quite a necessary thing at the moment. Well, the same is absolutely true in Ireland. And after some initial teething problems, we've taken to it big time. Um, in very significant hearings all the way up to the Supreme Court are now being dealt with remotely. And Judge Barnabal perhaps could, could talk about that from the, the judicial aspect or perspective of it. But even from an arbitration perspective, I mean, I have, for example, starting on the 1st of November, a two week hearing in an ICC arbitration, which is located here in Dublin, but the parties are spread across uh, Finland, the United States and England. And there are a large number of witnesses, all of whom are going to give evidence remotely. And there is a three month arbitration scheduled to begin in April, uh, which is also going to be heard remotely uh, with, I think, currently 29 witnesses scheduled for hearing spread across a wide variety of jurisdictions as well. So both from the arbitration perspective and from the court perspective, um, and partly because of the broadband facility that is here, um, the remote hearings are something that we have all got accustomed to very quickly and have adjusted to. Um, but perhaps Judge Barnabal could give a perspective on that. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Michael. And James, if I could just um, if I could just come in there. Um, yeah, when the, the pandemic hit in, in March here, the middle of March, uh, virtually all court proceedings came to a standstill, except for very urgent things, things that could be done on paper, things that could be done with very, very small numbers of people. And it became, it became clear that we, we couldn't continue like that, that it was going to be necessary uh, in commercial cases, in, in, in family law cases, in a whole range of different cases, to try to get, get quickly in place a system to allow remote hearings um, to take place. We, we didn't have a tradition of doing remote hearings. For example, we didn't do what some uh, courts do, which is to have telephone hearings and things like that. We haven't tended to do that. But very quick, quickly, we have to, between the court service, the judiciary and the practitioners, to develop a system for remote hearings, which we did pretty quickly. And with effect from the middle of April, we were back up and running and um, dealing with all of the commercial cases remotely at that point, except for some limited, uh, limited exceptions. Um, it, it wasn't possible until relatively recently to resume witness actions remotely because there was certainly a concern, a concern on the part of practitioners, a concern on the part of judges, that the particular remote hearing platform that we were required to use was not really suited to witness evidence, to witness actions. Um, we've now allowed, and the, uh, um, the, our, our legislation has intervened to give courts a much wider uh, um, discretion in terms of the hearing platforms um, that can be used for remote hearings. And so we have now started having witness cases using remote hearing platforms. Uh, and it looks like our, our, our uh, COVID restrictions are going to be, are going to be intensified over the next few weeks here. And if we um, aren't able to have cases dealt with remotely, then the whole system will break down again. So thankfully there has been significant investment in remote hearing technology. The courts are now given wide powers to hear cases remotely. And what is going to be, I think, for the future, um, the cases will be heard either remotely or incorporating remote technology. So they'll be what we're calling here hybrid, hybrid hearings. And we have currently a couple of commercial court trials going on, which are being dealt with on a hybrid basis. So some of the lawyers and parties are in court, some of them are engaging uh, re remotely. But that is the only way, I think, forward uh, in the uh, current public health uh, environment that we're, we're living in. Um, we all we all having to get used to dealing with remote hearings. Um, they, in my own personal view, they um, they're better than no hearings. 
Uh, in some cases, they can be very good. It's not the optimal situation. I think the optimal situation is to have the lawyers and the parties in court physically so that you can actually see the people, you can listen to them properly, and you can get all the nuances that you don't really get in some cases on, uh, on a, remote, a remote hearing platform. But needs must, and I, 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 one thing people are always very critical, I think, of, or often critical of our service here, one thing they have done is to move uh, and, and to get the resources and to move pretty quickly to put remote hearings in place. And we're all coming more comfortable um, in, it, in it. I mean, pretty much all of the cases I'm hearing now, with some exceptions, are, are dealt with remotely. Uh, and I'd much rather be able to leave my chambers and go into court, but I, I, I haven't really been able to do that very much because almost everything has been done remotely. Uh, thank you, Joe Patrick, as, as the Irish arbitration practitioners. Uh, we've received one question from uh, an attendee regarding third party funding in Ireland. And we are seeing this across the world as a growing trend in recent years. I'm wondering if you could uh, provide some insight into the regulation of third party funding in Ireland. Yes. Um, well, there, there was a case brought to the uh, Irish Supreme Court. Um, two or three years ago, in which it was argued that third party funding should be permissible in Ireland uh, as not being contrary to maintenance and champerty rules, which still operate in theory, at least in Ireland, uh, on the basis that it facilitated access to the court and the constitutional right in that respect. Ultimately, the Supreme Court, while sympathetic to that point of view, felt that the question of altering the laws on maintenance and champerty uh, was a matter for the legislature. Uh, even though those laws, certainly in their criminal aspect, have never been enforced since the foundation of the state and civil cases brought for damages for maintenance and champerty are very, very um, rare indeed. Um, so it's sometimes said that in consequence of that decision, it isn't possible to engage in third party funding in Ireland. Um, that's not entirely true. The, the court have, has made clear that there are quite a number of circumstances in which versions of third party funding are permissible. For example, if somebody, a funder, takes some sort of an equity stake in one of the parties and finances the litigation by reason of that equity stake, that may be a sufficient connection between the uh, funder and the parties um, to, to be justifiable. So it may be a matter of more restructuring of the arrangements rather than any substantive or principled objection which put, puts up an insuperable barrier to it. And secondly, the government and the Law Reform Commission are actively looking at the question of reform in any event of the outdated laws on maintenance and champerty, some of which go back to the 12th and 13th century and, as I say, have never been in, in reality enforced. So um, it, it is an area that does need some updating but it would be wrong to come away with the impression that it's not possible to engage in third party funding and things like after the event insurance, for example, which, if you think about the principles of it, are very similar to third party funding, have been fully upheld by the Irish courts. Thanks, Michael. Um, so, in, in, in the last couple of months, uh, working remotely and uh, despite the pandemic, um, we were still seeing a lot of developments in, in, in the legal field and in jurisprudence on arbitration. Um, so uh, I'd, I'd ask my colleague Sarah Reynolds to, to give some thoughts on um, how arbitration has been affected by recent decisions of the U.S. Supreme Court and growing trends in arbitration in the U.S. Sure, sure, James, I'd be happy to do that. So in June of this year, in fact, international arbitration did get some attention from the Supreme Court in the Autocampu case, um, where the court unanimously resolved a split among federal appellate courts and what was an increasingly complex arbitration law issue. And the, the issue was whether under certain state law doctrines, in the case, the pertinent case, it was an equitable estoppel doctrine, non-party, sorry, non-signatories to an arbitration agreement could force signatories to arbitrate disputes. And, and prior to this decision, I can tell you this was my least favorite question to get from clients because the answers were just so complicated. And it was really difficult to ever answer yes or no. It was a, a maybe and then an extremely fact intensive inquiry about whether or not you could compel a non-signatory to arbitrate. So in this case, the Supreme Court found that those state law doctrines don't conflict with the New York Convention, which is, um, as many of you know, the Convention in the United States relevant to enforcing awards. 
and I'll spare you the details of the of the case here. It was a, a rather complicated uh, factual history. We included in the materials for this presentation a um, case note on on the case if you want more detail. But the key takeaway um, is that the court was unmistakably clear that the York, New York Convention does not necessarily bar state doctrines allowing non-signatories to compel arbitration. Um, so giving parties the freedom to continue to, to, to attempt to do that. And in this case really adds to the sort of ever growing pro arbitration jurisprudence that's coming out of the US Supreme Court and has been for some time. Um, but there was a time when arbitration lawyers outside of the United States would complain that US courts get too involved with arbitrations. Um, and even some of us US lawyers may have agreed that that was true for a time. But this is really yet another ruling in a long line of rulings from the US Supreme Court that limits um, lower courts ability really to meddle in arbitrations. And that has been a clear, a clear trend and a consistent message from the US Supreme Court for some time now. Uh, so Sarah, regarding uh, US jurisprudence, uh, it comes to mind that with so many US tech, tech companies having their EU headquarters in Dublin and their subsidiaries incorporated in Ireland, um, as well as something like 20 out of the top 25 financial services companies having a presence in Ireland. Uh, there's an issue about these, about parties, opposing parties in an arbitration in Ireland, possibly going to the US to get uh, discovery from the parent corporation. Um, can you opine as to whether US court, federal courts have the authority to order discovery for use in private international arbitrations outside of the US and particularly in Ireland? Sure. And so th this is sort of the new messy now now that we've resolved the non signatory issue. This is the latest and greatest and messy issues in US arbitration law. Um, it's a pending issue here um, and it's one that we all have our eyes on. Um, it's certainly an issue to watch. And, and the issue is whether federal district courts have authority to order discovery for use in private international arbitrations under a particular US code section and that's section 1782. Um, this we currently have a, a circuit split here. I think there are three circuits on one side and three circuits on the other. Um, and the issue is is right for decision in the ninth circuit, um, you know, which is important to us here in California. And so we may even have uh, an additional court weighing in on the issue if the Supreme Court doesn't decide it first. Um, we do think this is a pretty likely issue to go to the Supreme Court in coming terms. Um, it's it's a perfectly teed up circuit split, which you know the Supreme Court likes. They they like they like circuit courts to have weighed in on the issue before they get involved. And then because some circuits allow this discovery and others don't, and, and in fact, in in one particular case, um, there were petitions for this type of discovery in two different circuits in the US that related to the same underlying arbitration. And because the circuits are on opposite sides of this fence, they got different results. So in one petition, they were allowed to pursue the, the, the discovery and in another, they weren't. Um, and the, the US Supreme Court really does not like it when laws are being applied un uniformly like that and when sort of illogical things are happening. So that's another reason why we really think that the Supreme Court is going to pay attention to this case in the coming terms. And then finally, you know, similar to what happened after Justice Kavanaugh's confirmation, given the relatively acrimonious nomination battle um, that's going on currently, as in today, um, over Jane, Judge Amy Coney, Coney Barrett's confirmation, it's likely that the Supreme Court will, will take up primarily uncontroversial commercial disputes like this in the next terms as opposed to more controversial social issues so very unlikely to see you know abortion or marriage equality cases in the next term the court's really going to want to focus on these sort of plain vanilla um, pretty straightforward commercial disputes that aren't going to upset anybody or excite anybody too much um, chief justice roberts is going to want to avoid any additional support scrutiny of the Supreme Court during political, current political divisions here in the United States in order to, you know, in an effort to preserve the legitimacy of the court as a non-political institution. So that's another reason that we really expect this issue to come to head either in this term or in one of the coming terms. Um, so, so I think, I think what, we get, what we've heard from Sarah as well is about um, 
the, the circuit splits in the US, how there's a lack of uniformity across the, across the federal system. Um, we've also uh, received a question from a, an attendee about appellate review of um, arbitra arbitration-related court decisions in Ireland. Um, and, and given this, I, I'd welcome um, any further thoughts from Justice Carnival. Um, Justice Carnival, you, you, you mentioned earlier how the High Court and you as the designated arbitration judge in Ireland um, are one-stop shop. Um, I, I compare yeah. this with uh, the system in England and Wales, where under the Arbitration Act 1996, uh, there is a broader right of appeal from the from the decisions related to arbitration. I, could could you uh, provide some brief comments regarding uh, appeals of uh, the High Court's decisions on arbitration, and when when is that possible? Well, it's almost never possible. So most orders that uh, you're asked to make in an arbitration related matter, the the Act, the 2010 Act says there's no appeal from it. So um, as things stand with very, very, whether that's um, uh, enforcement, refusal to enforce, whether it's a stay application, whether it's an application to set aside an award, there's no appeal on any of those, from any of those decisions to our Court of Appeal or our Supreme Court. Um, now that's what the Act says. Um, it, I wouldn't rule out the possibility that somebody might seek to challenge the constitutionality of the provision of the Act and say that in some way, because of a, a, a constitutional change we had when establishing the new Court of Appeal here in 2014, that in some way it might be possible to squeeze an appeal in. But but the Act says no appeal, and I, I suspect it might be a long shot uh, uh, to anybody for anybody who wishes to challenge that. So we don't have the problem that they have in England and Wales, where you get a proliferate or the possibility of uh, several appeals through their appellate system that to their court of appeal and then ultimately to their Supreme Court. Most of those uh, appeals being um, ultim ultimately, most of the challenges in England being ultimately unsuccessful and the appeals being ultimately unsuccessful. But the, the fact that such appeals are allowed does have the disadvantage of delay in the resolution of the issues no no matter how uh, no matter how um, efficient the court system may be so our um parliament here took the view that a took a policy decision that in arbitration cases there is there there is a, sig a significant um merit in having a speedy swift and certain conclusion to any challenge and, and therefore it has decided, our parliament has decided in the legislation to rule out appeals by and large in most arbitration related cases, which are dealt with in the High Court. Right, uh, thank you, Judge. Um, so so it's, it's rare for me to have an opportunity to uh, speak with a former Taoiseach and former ambassador of the US, or ambassador of the European Union uh, to the United States. Um, so I think I'll be somewhat cheeky and ask uh, Mr. Bruton if he uh, has any thoughts on the prospect of there actually being a Brexit deal? And uh, does he have any final thoughts on why uh, our clients uh, should choose Ireland for uh, uh, as, a, as a center for um, a, a resolution of their disputes? Uh, Mr. Bruton, you're on mute. Sorry, um, I, I think it's still likely that there will be a Brexit deal, but uh, the big problem is a breakdown in trust. Uh, the fact that the UK government in the international internal market bill that it introduced took power to unilaterally set aside some of the provisions of the international treaty withdrawing Britain from the EU that it had agreed only um, a couple of months previously. The fact that it was taking the power to break international law has created quite a bit of distrust in continental Europe. And there is a feeling that even if an agreement is reached, uh, that there'll be a risk that the UK will not honor it or will pretend not to understand it. Uh, and this, of course, is making the finalization of a deal more difficult. Also, we're obviously running out of time. Uh, it is the EU's view that there has to be a full agreement in print in, in, on all the political matters outstanding by the end of October to allow 
the actual drafting to be completed in time of the agreement, which will probably run to thousands of pages, which will then have to be approved by the UK and EU parliaments. Uh, and the more we run up against the deadline, the greater is the risk that there could be problems in the either in the drafting or in the approving of the final agreement. Uh, so I think we've left it very late, but on balance, uh, one always hopes that uh, common sense will prevail. The, the issues that remain to be settled in and of themselves are not enormous. The issue about fisheries, uh, issue about uh, the regulation of state aids to industry. In and of themselves, those issues should be uh, e easily settled. But unfortunately, the whole question has been invested with um, all this uh, high drama politics and distrust. So things could still go wrong. Uh, thank you, Mr. Bruton. Uh, so, so we've heard today from uh, from Mr. Bruton, uh, Judge Barnival, and all of our other panelists, um, and we, we and we've also seen recently in the media, in the, in the Financial Times, and in other international publications. Um, that Ireland, in light of Brexit, is poised to take advantage of its status as a common law jurisdiction integrated into the European Union. Um, Ireland is English speaking, pro business, and has an efficient commercial court with a dedicated arbitration judge, who we've heard from today, uh, Mr. Justice Barnival. Um, uh, given, all, given all this, um, it, and from everything we've heard today, uh, uh, the increased interest from our clients in arbitrating in Ireland. Uh, appears quite justified. Um, we welcome any further uh, further questions um, that, that may be directed to us by email. Uh, unfortunately, we have reached our time limit for today's webinar, uh, and this therefore concludes today's webinar. And we hope that the information that has been shared was useful, and we thank you so much for your participation and for joining us today. Thank you very much. My pleasure, James. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, James.